Today we're back with the Intel DG1 standalone video card. We tested this already for gaming performance, but now we're specifically looking at some of Intel's creative claims for production performance. The company hasn't been pushing this device too hard, to be fair. It's only available in certain pre-builds, and it only works with certain motherboards right now. But it's sort of a look at where Intel's going eventually with its GPUs, and it uses the Intel Iris Xe architecture and uh, precedes the DG2 GPUs that you all will likely be interested in for gaming later. So let's start looking at the production capabilities and some of Intel's own expectations. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake and the Thermaltake Tough Ram XG memory. Thermaltake's Tough Ram XG series is a freshly updated line of RGB memory available in frequencies ranging from 3600 megahertz up to 4600 megahertz. Thermaltake's Tough Ram XG uses 10 layer PCBs and heat spreaders affixed with bright LEDs everywhere and they market toward overclocking support and capabilities. Learn more at the links in the description below. We're not going to go over the architecture again in this piece. We did that in the first piece on the gaming side of things where we talked about the uh, sort of containerization of everything where they've got slices and sub slices, did some comparisons to ease understanding a little bit to NVIDIA's architecture, AMD's architecture. So we've already gone through that. That's in the gaming piece. It'll be linked below if you're curious. It also has benchmarks for gaming performance versus the GT1030. The GT1030 is what the Intel DG1 card, that would be this thing, as opposed to the embedded graphic solutions, uh, the DG1 card is most targeted against. So the GT1030 is on the cheaper or the cheapest side of things from NVIDIA. It is GT, not GTX, and that's relevant because GT lacks some of the physical hardware capabilities of the higher end NVIDIA or AMD devices, and that's why Intel thinks that it has a bit of an advantage targeting the lower end of the market. Now, it's also meant for small business users, and this became evident when in our gaming tests, it had some key uh, deficiencies in its performance, namely the frame time consistency. From frame to frame, we saw significantly more spikes or excursions from the previous or next frame with Intel's DG1 and Iris Xe than we did with anyone else's device. But that was in the, the gaming piece, if you want to check that out. Thanks, Steve. Back to you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. So Intel XE is the GPU microarchitecture like Ampere or RDNA2. XELP is the variant of that microarchitecture that's currently for sale. The XELP family includes the Rocket Lake 14 nanometer plus plus UHD 730, the UHD 750 IGPs, the Tiger Lake 10 nanometer Iris XE G4 and G7 IGPs, and what we call the DG1, by which we specifically mean the discrete card that we're looking at today, but it's really the code name for Intel Iris Xe Max graphics, the D standing for discrete. Discrete only means that the chip is not on the same die as the CPU, which is what differentiates it from the G7 IGPs. As we said before, as a quick recap, this is an 80 EU version of the card. You can, in a sense, think of EU as maybe like SMs from NVIDIA or something like that. You can't really cross compare architectures, but that's kind of the gist of it. So this is an 80 EU version. There is a 96 EU Iris Xe device that's available in laptops. Uh, and it's, it's also discrete. It's not part of the CPU silicon. It's not part of monolithic die. It's a separate thing. But this is cut down from that. And the frequencies are a little bit higher in the external version, at least in marketing. Now we're going to make things easy on ourselves and mostly refer to Intel's standalone graphics card as the DG1 in this piece. That's out of convenience. And also because we don't want to hear the words Intel Iris Xe again. It's a little bit hard to keep track of Intel's naming. The clear and obvious purpose of the DG1 as a standalone card is to compete with the NVIDIA 1030 in pre-built. 1030 is what Intel pits the DG1 against in its own materials. The DG1 supports hardware accelerated video encoding, while the GT cards do not. In a sense, this makes the DG1 the more capable option in terms of things like light production workloads or small business workloads because, well, it, it has the feature. And one thing we can't really do is benchmarking for a GT device without hardware accelerated video encoding versus a device with hardware accelerated encoding because it's, it's not a matter of performance. It's a matter of one has the feature and the other one doesn't. We do have benchmarks though, and we're going to be going through things like Adobe Premiere, Photoshop, video upscale, handbrake, uh, and some of the workloads uh, with DaVinci Resolve, for example. But our main goal was to find a use case for this. So we set out mostly to, to try and understand this. It's a new product, Intel's new-ish to GPUs in this 
form factor. It's been doing them a long time, obviously, but doesn't have anywhere near the level of driver experience as NVIDIA uh, or, or build experience as NVIDIA and AMD. But we're going to try and figure out what this is good at and where it might make sense to use. This is partly out of our own interest because we're always looking for ways to accelerate our video scrubbing or rendering pipeline uh, and improve our production capabilities. This is kind of a production card in a sense, low end, but uh, it might be able to help with acceleration. So that's our goal today. We're going to start with Adobe Premiere and some of the other uh, Adobe Suite stuff like Photoshop, and then we'll work through it, see how the card does. For benchmarking, we'll start with Adobe Premiere for this one. We're the most familiar with it. It's something we use every day. And it's also something that we have a vested interest in, in terms of improving performance or accelerating performance, if Intel has a better option for us. Adobe Premiere includes options for hardware accelerated decoding and encoding in its software. We've actually mentioned in the past that uh, accelerating timeline playback with Intel's QuickSync video or QSV has benefited us for QSV decoding. It's been an easy way to improve the scrubbing performance specifically. Scrubbing, if you're not familiar, is uh, at least what we refer to the process of dragging the playhead, so where the video is currently situated, dragging that across the timeline and viewing the video as we scrub through it so we can quickly sort of QC the video or check what's going on on the screen at any time, as opposed to slower scrubbing where you'll drag it to a spot, it'll kind of hitch, stick on a frame or two, and then eventually load the frame you want to see. So that's scrubbing performance. Hopefully the editors have dropped something in to show you what it looks like, just in case you're not familiar with the terminology. And previously, we used the i7-8086K workstations for our editing rigs. It's not particularly high-end as far as professional production work goes, but we found it worked great for Intel QSV. We did eventually ditch those. Uh, we would use NVIDIA NV Encoder even with the 8086Ks for the final rendering. So when we were doing uh, encoding, at the end of the video process, we'd use NVIDIA. At this point, though, none of our production systems have Intel IGPs anymore. We've moved away from them completely. We have one for our primary render machine that uses an AMD Threadripper 3960X. The secondary machine uses an Intel Xeon W3175X. By the way, it's been really a letdown, that system overall, but that's another story. And even our non-video workstations use a mixture of obsolete HDDT CPUs that we have retired from testing. If Intel's DG1 were sold standalone or worked as an add-in card for more than a few motherboards, it would be a great way for us to get back QSV decoding capability in our workstations. To simulate this, we stuck an NVIDIA 1660 Super, which is commonly found in pre-builds, in the primary PCIe slot of our CyberPower pre-build, and then we moved the DG1 to a secondary slot. Unfortunately, this didn't work. Premiere is very picky about hardware and driver compatibility, and it's bad at explaining its problems to the user. We were able to get Premiere working with the DG1 on its own, but to demonstrate the benefits of an Intel and NVIDIA pairing, we were forced to use the 10900K's iGP. The GT1030 was the lone GPU that didn't finish this test. CPU encoding was used for this configuration, and repeated encoding errors prevented the test from finishing. The 5700G, the UHD630, and the DG1 all technically completed the benchmark, but were inadequate for actual use in production. There was terrible choppy playback, and we also experienced extremely long, unusable render time. These wouldn't work for our standards of production work, and it's not like we're a movie studio. We post things on YouTube. It's not that complicated. As mentioned previously, we were rarely able to get Premiere to use the DG1 at all. The 5700G was the best of the three, but even the least demanding playback tests overwhelmed it. The 1660 Super was the only card we tested that was usable for editing, with an export score of 208% higher than the DG1, and a playback score of 184% higher, with the scores in the extended section of the benchmark favoring the 1660 Super even more heavily. Premiere did recognize the integrated UHD 630 in the 10900K that we used for testing, so we ran one test pass with Intel Hardware Accelerated Decoding and NVIDIA Hardware Accelerated Encoding. The results were better than anything else we'd tested. The export scores were still dependent on the 1660 and remained unchanged, but the playback was noticeably smoother with a 32% improvement in the standard playback test and a 22% improvement in the extended playback test. This is exactly why we've used Intel IGPs for Premiere editing in the past, even when we've had more powerful HEDT CPUs available. If it were possible to buy standalone DG1s and toss them in our render systems, we'd probably do it, but it's not, so 
It doesn't matter. <laughs> on to Handbrake now. So Handbrake has a couple of options on the market. You can use CLI, the command line interface. You can use the graphics user interface. But either way, Intel had its own internal Handbrake testing tool that it distributed to us for this process. We didn't use it. We didn't like it. We looked at it a bit, and we found the tool to be overly complicated. It was poorly coded. It was buggy. And so we continued to use our own transcoding Handbrake test instead, where we use the Handbrake CLI build. It's, it's, it's right there, Intel. Could have used it. But for some reason, they didn't, and uh, the whole thing's very buggy. So we scrapped that. Intel's reviewer guide mentions that, quote, multiple streams can be encoded simultaneously if additional QSV-capable products are available. For example, an iGPU with QSV and a discrete card with QSV, obviously suggesting the pairing we're testing today. This is a feature of the Handbrake GUI version. What that means in practice is that Handbrake queues videos for transcoding and hands off queued videos to the first available idle Intel GPU. Multiple GPUs do not work together on the same video. The UHD 630 in the 10900K that we used for testing was so much slower than the DG1 that it ended up bottlenecking the testing, holding up the test at the end until the IGP could complete transcoding its video, leaving the GPU to do nothing. This isn't really a unique feature to Intel. You could already use Handbrake to render multiple videos on multiple GPUs, or even multiple brands of GPUs if you wanted. We really want to drive this point home because Intel has marketed the idea of DG1s and IGPs, especially in laptops, being sort of better together, which is uh, the most wonderful marketing phrase that all of the companies have used at some point, AMD included. But in this instance, it's really sort of misleading because they only work together in the sense that an NVIDIA GPU and an Intel iGPU work together, or an AMD GPU and an NVIDIA GPU work together. They're not doing anything special. There's no communication between the devices, at least insofar as processing the same video, maybe uh, checking that they exist, but that's about it. Uh, and so they don't really work together. It's nothing special. You could do this with any pairing of devices. QSV capable ones don't get some sort of special SLI-like thing that's enabled as a result of using them in the same system. So that is misleading. Uh, and if you see it discussed relating to Handbrake specifically, you can, you can kindly ignore it. It's sort of the same way that Blender works, really. If you think about Blender cycles rendering, where it does tile-based rendering, you can, with newer versions, tell Blender to render with both a CPU and a GPU. But the problem you get into, with Blender specifically, is now you're, you've got tile sizes of maybe 16 by 16 for the CPU, so that you've got all these threads doing a lot of smaller pieces of the image, uh, and maybe 256 by 256 for the DGPU, where you've got uh, one device, the GPU, that can process one thing a large tile, 256 by 256, as opposed to multiple threads from a CPU doing it. And so the end result is you have a, a mismatched configuration in terms of efficiency for getting the work done quickly. And then you also have the slowest of the devices holding up the entire process at the end. So if the GPU processes 95% of the image while the CPU is sitting on one thread, one tile, the GPU does nothing. It can't help accelerate it. It can't take over. It can't contribute at all. And it's the same thing here with Handbrake, where if you have an IGP at the end still working away slowly and a GPU sitting there, it may actually swing the other way and take longer than if you had just queued it all on one device. Hopefully that makes sense. For our testing, we transcoded a 1080p video from H.264 to H.265 with the balanced QSV preset, or the medium NV encoder preset. QSV decoding was used where available, and we used the most recent nightly build of Handbrake at the time of testing, which is a couple days before publishing. Intel did do its own similar Handbrake test for its reviewer guide, but with only one result, rendering the score <laughs> meaningless. Can't do anything with it. The GT1030 was awarded a DNF, or did not finish, by Intel because it lacks a hardware encoder. This, again, is somewhat misleading because Handbrake is still capable of transcoding videos without GPU acceleration. And besides, GT1030s are frequently paired with inexpensive CPUs, often that Intel makes, that include QSV-capable IGPs, like the i3-10100 that Intel used for its own testing, and yet they didn't present that on the chart. The DG1 completed the transcode in 138.7 seconds with QSV, while the 1660 Super completed it in 141.7 seconds with NV encoder. These scores are practically identical against NVIDIA GTX or RTX cards with hardware encoding, the DG1 offers no significant advantage in this test. 
The more favorable comparison is against the configuration using the GT1030, which took 764 seconds to complete the transcode. The DG1 requires a massive 82% less time in handbrake for transcoding. However, because the 1030 lacks NV encoder, it was actually the i9-10900K doing the work. At least that's with the non-GPU accelerated X265 encoder. A GT1030 would normally be paired with a lower end CPU, giving the DG1 even more of an advantage. Using the 10900K's UHD630 IGP for acceleration did reduce the transcode time though, down to 598 seconds, which is a significant improvement over software encoding, but still abysmal compared to the DGPUs. Our second test was to perform the same transcoding task with three instances of handbrake simultaneously. The DG1 showed a more distinct advantage here, with the render time 20% reduced from the 1660 Supers. The 1660 Super and 5700G were essentially tied at about 409 seconds and 414 seconds respectively, while both the CPU and code with the unusable GT1030 and the run accelerated with the UHD630 took around half an hour, completely impractical unless there were really no other option. The information we can take away from this is that the DG1 is one of the cheapest ways to get decent encoding performance with a program like Handbrake. The competitors in this category are integrated graphics from AMD and Intel itself, a Tiger Lake IGP would work well, and laptop XE Max DG1s might even perform better thanks to the extra EUs. In Photoshop, the GT1030 was 12% ahead of the DG1 and the 1660 Super ended up 58% ahead in the GPU subcategory. The 5700G scored similarly to the 1660 Super, but with a score of 106 in the GPU category versus the Super's 114. Given our difficulties getting the DG1 to be recognized by Premiere, it seems likely that Photoshop had similar difficulties properly taking advantages of the hardware, although it was utilized. In the overall score category, the 1030 was still 10% ahead. There are some specific applications where the DG1 has a significant advantage over the 1030, but in applications that don't take advantage of Intel's hardware, the 1030 is just as capable and the 5700G and 1660 Super are significantly ahead. DaVinci Resolve is, like Premiere, popular software for video editing and rendering. Unlike Premiere, it has good hardware support and a logical menu layout that allows assigning specific GPUs for encoding and decoding. So we were able to do a test with the 1660 Super encoding and the DG1 decoding. Unfortunately, the current Puget Resolve benchmark beta doesn't test playback as the Premiere version does, which is one area we'd really like to test for this hardware as well. In the categories that are tested currently, performance was basically unchanged when using the DG1 for decoding, with the lone 1660 Super 0.7% ahead in the standard overall score and 1.2% ahead in the extended overall score. We had problems with every other GPU configuration in this test. The DG1 was either stuck or taking countless hours to complete the test to the point where we abandoned it. The 1030 ran out of VRAM, unsurprisingly, and the 5700G repeatedly caused the test system to hard crash and reboot, which is a completely new and severe type of error that we hadn't yet seen on the 5700G. Resolve can work with low-end graphics hardware, for sure, but not at the level that this current test suite demands. Topaz Lab's Gigapixel AI is software that intelligently, in theory, upscales images. This is one of the tests that Intel chose to include in its reviewer guide, and it's the only one of those tests that we decided to replicate. The rest of them we reworked and did on our own because we didn't really like the way Intel was doing them. We used Intel's set of 10 images and upscaled each by 4x with the standard preset using the GPU for acceleration where available. This does not require video encoding hardware, and therefore the GT1030 or any other graphics hardware can be manually assigned as the processor to use, even if the CPU would be a better choice. We found that trying to use the GT1030 caused the upscaling queue to fail partway through, but based on the speed at which it completed the first few images, it's unlikely that it would perform better than the 10900K's 237 second completion time anyway. Using the 10900K's IGP for processing instead resulted in a much higher time of 613 seconds, while using the standalone DG1 resulted in a much lower time of 84 seconds. Intel's DG1 card needed 10% less time than the 1660 Super and 19% less time than AMD's 5700G in this task. It seems like there's some merit to Intel's claims about being good at AI tasks, at least in this software. Intel also pointed out that Topaz takes advantage of the DP4A instruction frequently used in AI tasks and is now supported by XELP GPUs. 
DP4A has been supported by NVIDIA GPUs since at least 2016. One further feature that's available in Intel's DG1 is AV1 decoding capability. This is something that Intel's been quick to point out in some of its marketing. Uh, it's a feature that's available on NVIDIA 30 series cards. It's on AMD RDNA 2 devices. That would be the RX 6000 series, for example. And that's through the AMD VCN 3.0 hardware core. As for the 5600G, the 5700G, and any other APUs in that family, those contain VCN 2.0 for the hardware code core, which is not capable of AV1 decoding. AV1 is a video coding format that is backed by streaming services like Netflix, Google or YouTube, Amazon and Hulu, as well as a laundry list of other major players like Nvidia, AMD, Intel, Apple, and Microsoft. The purpose of this consortium, the uh, so-called Alliance for Open Media, is to replace Moving Picture Expert Group, or MPEG, and the standards like MPEG-4 and HEVC with instead a royalty-free alternative. Adoption of AV1 thus far has been slow. But given that basically every major hardware and software and video vendor is a part of AOM at this point, not Age of Mythology, uh, AO Media, uh, and wants to dump MPEG, it seems like it will get adoption, it's just a matter of working towards it and replacing something that's been around forever. So right now, Intel has the cheapest route to AV1 decoding hardware. That's potentially an advantage at some point. Uh, as this capability comes down to NVIDIA and AMD budget cards, already in the high end, the and the APUs, it'll become less special as a selling point for Intel, but it's still a selling point today. If you specifically need that capability today, and you would know if you do, then maybe trying to get a system with a DG1 in it is worth doing ahead of, uh, say, the DG2 launch. So it's also kind of important here that only decoding is hardware accelerated on this version, this generation of AMD, NVIDIA, and Intel hardware. So we can't yet tell Handbrake to transcode a file and time it as a benchmark. It's just sort of, it's decoding that's available. And uh, if you don't think you need it or you don't know that you need it, then you probably don't. But at some point, it'll start becoming important. And at that point, it's going to be on everyone's hardware. Thanks, Steve. Ow, my knees. So that's it for the Intel DG1 card for production capabilities. The idea of a, an Intel card standalone with QSV is pretty cool. And the reason is, you can't get that feature in HEDT CPUs, whether it's AMD or Intel. So we've got HEDT high-end desktop CPUs in use for video editing. We made those changes for a lot of reasons. As stated, we used to use 8086Ks because they had IGPs, but over time, it just wasn't able to keep up in certain other tasks that we did on those systems or in the video editing pipeline, in the rendering pipeline as the videos got more complicated. We needed the extra threads. We needed the memory bandwidth, all of that stuff. And so we had to ditch the IGP CPUs, even though they had some advantages for things like scrubbing playback. But uh, getting it in a standalone card would be something we would actually consider buying these standalone to put in our Threadripper systems, our W3175X system. We're going to replace that with another Threadripper system, though. We would buy one of these to, to throw in there and use as basically an accelerator. Unfortunately, uh, it, it wasn't really meant to get to us. It was launched and pre-built somewhat silently, and that's kind of where it's lived. And so that means that there's not any motherboard support. It works on the boards that it ships in, and that's kind of it. We have tried it on other boards doesn't boot. Uh, you get a VGA error on the board. And that's expected. And because Intel's not marketing it for that, we can't fault them too much for it. But don't go buy a pre-built with this in it and think you're going to rip it out, put it in a high-end editing system, and get benefits of QSV, because it's just not going to work. Or at least in our situation where we tested it, it hasn't. And Intel has told us that they don't expect it to work in just any board either, because there has to be uh, a firmware handshake sort of between the device to make it all work together. So with all those restrictions, the only advantage of the discrete DG1 over the existing soldered DG1 is that OEMs don't need to build custom hardware to support it. We'll have to wait for the DG2 to get the real advantages of a discrete GPU. Intel didn't promise the moon with the 80 EU DG1 card, and they're not really pushing it aggressively. There are some specific tasks, though, to which the DG1 is better suited than a GT1030. For a creator who needs a pre-built for processing video while keeping costs as low as possible, the DG1 outclasses the 1030. But any other higher-end graphics card from AMD or NVIDIA would be preferable. Once the DG1 is properly supported by Premiere, it might be a good way to improve playback. But an Intel IGP would also help here. And they're far easier to acquire 
and similar in the budget category as this would be. Plus, they don't eat up a PCIe slot. The DG1 might be a promising preview to the DG2. We'll see how that goes later. But there's definitely no need to stake out on eBay and look for one of these cards ripped out of a system, especially because you would need a specific board to run it anyway. So that gives you the full picture of the capabilities of the card as we've tested it thus far. We've got gaming in a separate video and production here. We'll have a separate teardown too. Just it looks simple, but we'll go over some of what Intel and ASUS are doing here. You can check all that on the channel. As always, subscribe for more. Thanks for watching and for supporting us in buying systems like the ones that contain these for review. It's been fun working on some different stuff lately. Uh, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our wireframe mouse mats. They're in the stock and shipping now. We've got a lot of them. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. And we'll see you all next time.